right, good morning everyone and welcome to our um, October Metro meeting. It's nice to be here in these beautiful chambers in Watsonville. Thanks for having us here. So I'll call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call. Uh, Director Brown. Present. Director Downing. Present. And Director Dutra is going to uh, come online, but I haven't seen him yet. Uh, Director Colin Terry Johnson. Present. Director Koenig. Present. Director Lind. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Newsom. Present. Director Pegler is absent today. Director Kiros Carter. Uh, and Director Rockin. Here. And ex officio Director Henderson is absent today. And ex officio Director Northcutt. Here. Thank you, and we have quorum. Great. Thank you. Um, today's meeting is being broadcast as by, broadcasted by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And let me just see, do we have language service here? Is anyone here from language line service? No. Okay. So we do not have interpretation um, here today. All right, we'll move to item four, which is board of directors comments. Any comments from board of directors? Okay. So we'll go to oral communication. It's noted that we have received some oral communication um, via email, and those are in our packet. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak on items not on the agenda? But hopefully related to transit issues. Thank you, and, <laughs> and related to transit issues. Related to what? Transit. Yes. Okay. Pills to get water off my body. I could be a baby. I could be an adult. I could be a kid. But when you get off the bus after riding the 71 and you're on that thing for an hour and 10, 15 minutes, it's running late and you have to use the bathroom and you're going into Santa Cruz and they tell you, sorry, we're clean, bathrooms are being cleaned, you need to go down two blocks. You're putting a senior citizen, anybody in the elements of society down there to get hurt. You have not taken them from where they need to go to where they go without putting their welfare in jeopardy. There's not no, there, that, that would not sound too good on the headlines on your part. Man uses bathroom being told to go two blocks away, gets mugged on the way coming back. Or maybe I should slip a diaper on or something. I don't know. But the answer is not send them away. You got two bathrooms there. When you go to your house, you got a his and hers. No, you got a bathroom. Put a lock on it. Do something. The guy had enough time to argue with me, but he didn't have enough time to come up with the solution. That's one occasion in this last couple of weeks. Your, your Santa Cruz, your Watsonville Circular bus broke down the other day. I had an appointment at 1.30 at Crestview. It's the end of the month. I'm on Social Security. I asked your ladies at the attendant, will you get me on the 10 after bus? Does that mean I, I could ride that for free? No, that's not our problem, was the response. What kind of service is that? Customer service? It's all written in the words, customer service. Wouldn't have been nothing to, to say, hey, look, our bus break down, talk to the driver or whatever. That was sad. Same thing with missing buses. Have a cut-in bus like Monterey Metro used to do. When you're running, you got a driver that's been over and flipping and flipping. He don't even have enough time to take a break, and he's got to go back out there. And maybe overtime and all that. You can bring a bus over in the morning and take a bus back at night. They told me all that need to be serviced. You got drivers. You got extra drivers. According to drivers, not according to customer service, they could show me nothing in literature. They have they got to be the cheapest yes persons I've ever seen. Didn't cost you but a day's education to teach them to say yes, yes, no, no, yes, no. No communication whatsoever. And I'm not looking to anybody lose their job. Where do you guys come from? Any of you ever rode the bus? How do you fill those seats? Do you get down and take somebody from, from the bottom who's been there, who knows the needs, not the greeds? I'll give you the 20 seconds to somebody else. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, sir. Anyone else who wishes to speak on oral communications? Good morning. Good morning. Some of you know I've been an activist for 
more years than most. I'm 86 years young. I'm here to talk about something not on the agenda that deals with the problem of graffiti. Um, I, aside, but, um, sir, this not on the agenda and related to Metro business. Oh yeah, okay. haven't you seen the people who have to go around employed by you to take that graffiti where you have places like where I watch and see, you know, that you have to hire someone to take care of that problem. So it is related okay. to Metro. But it's also to say hello. Um, I'm Richard Lewis, full time. I am that I am a community organizer. And back in the days of AC, that's the Alameda service, Shamoon ran AC, but the kids thought that that was somebody that they just did a lot of graffiti. Somebody back in those days that ran a, 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 a system had Bay Area United Youth and he gave them office and sent them to the schools to deal with the graffiti problem. So I just wanted to share that. And as you know, you all got emails. Um, I'm not going to go into what I represent, but I'm not a stranger to some of you. So I hope that as we move forward that we'll have an opportunity to, to do what I represent. I want to say that as I looked for the Express, I was looking for being able, there was no 91 no more, but I did catch the bus. And I just want to say thank you. As I remember when there was a, a, a strike, it was let's be neighbors, let's be friends. So that's what you guys have created. And there's one particular person on your board that's sitting up there that I know that he'll remember how many, many years ago <laughs> we first met. With much respect, uh, the fact that you took policy to allow our young people to ride the bus for free, that didn't come from staff. It came from policy of the board. So I appreciate being my first time in this city hall, but for sure not in Santa Cruz. <laughs> uh, if you know what it means to be my age and not give up, that's something that people who know me, I'll never, never give up what's vision. And that's for a better Santa Cruz County. Thank you for uh, checking into Bay Area United Youth. We, we need to unite our youth. And I think that if it didn't pass, Carlos had indicated uh, January 1st, a new youth commission. Think what we can do to get them involved in, in the school system to do what it is that would help deal with that issue of graffiti. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Good morning, um, and, and welcome to our, our chambers. You know, it's been a while that um, we did some upgrades and we're still working on the little kinks. Um, but I wanted to give you an, an, an update um, uh, um, from uh, what we're doing um, on the hiring, because that's one of the critical points for our, our first phase of uh, um, reimagine. Um, so uh, currently, we've uh, processed, uh, uh, as of next Monday, we'll process 50 um, something applicants. Um, we're slated to um, bring in a class of um, about 20 people in mid-November. Um, so it's it's an incredible uh, um, task that you know HR has been, and I want I want to acknowledge all the HR staff have been, you know, uh, putting a lot of pressure on them, and you know they've uh, they've come through. Um, uh, um, but we're we're everybody's working real hard. The training departments working on their processes. We're working towards you know uh, getting th this tar uh, target date, but we're. We're uh, on target to get uh, uh, to get a, a lot of people so we can uh, put that service out there in the community. Um, one, uh, one of the highlights is that we're in farmers market. We've uh, we even been at the senior centers educating people. Read, uh, um, 
re redesign of our, uh, you know, reimagine how our community is going to look like, you know. So it, it's been great to be talking out there because uh, we're not only recruiting, we're educating at the same uh, at the same time for people that, that have questions. So it's been um, uh, great to be out there with, uh, with the community and educating. So like I said, I just wanted to put those efforts out there. And like, but we haven't had this big of an effort, um, uh, you know, uh, 20 people, uh, you know, at one time being since 2011, 2012. You know, when we, you know, up the service a little bit and then we, we went down, you know, a few years later. But, um, Greg, uh, uh, thanks for the, uh, for the opportunity. And like I said, I'll keep you posted how we're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for that update. Anyone else who wish to speak on oral communication? Do we have anyone online? Uh, no, there's no one with uh, their hand up. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to... Item six, labor organization communication. Good morning, Brandon Freeman, general chair, local 23. Uh, we're gonna keep it short today. I just wanted to introduce you all to this man to my right. His name is Jaime Renteria. He's an 18 year driver here and he is my chosen number two moving forward. Jaime, if you'd like to say a couple words. Good morning to all. Like he said, my name is Jaime Renteria, 18 years driving uh, for Santa Cruz Metro. It's been an opportunity and a privilege. Looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you. We are as well. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you, board. We'll be back later on a couple other things. Thank you. Okay. Um, item seven, additional documentation to support existing agenda items. Okay. There is none. We'll move on to consent, and that's items 8.1 through 8.9. Uh, so let me see if there are any items that board members wish to pull. Okay. Any items that board members wish to comment on? Okay. I'll go out to see if there's any um, public comment on consent items, 8.1 through 8.9. Okay. Move None approval. online? Not online. Okay, so I'll come back for a motion. Move, Move approval. approval. Second. Was that Director uh, Lind and second by Director Rotkin? And um, do we need to do a roll call? Okay. Uh, Director Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. Uh, Director Colin Terry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lind? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Direct and Director Rotkin? Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our regular agenda. Um, item nine is presentation of employee longevity award. And uh, today we have Leonel Ruiz Chavez for 10 years of service. Are you here, Mr. Chavez? Okay, not here. Thank you for your 10 years of service. We do have a certificate and a pin for you, so we'll get that to you. Okay, we also have item 10, which is retiree resolution of appreciation for Francisco Estrada. Is Mr. Estrada here? All right. Um, thank you for your years of service at the Metro. Move approval of the resolution. Second. All right. Uh, who would? Who that would? was Rotkin and Brown. Okay, Brown. I am sorry. I almost I did your <laughs> other last name. That's why I paused. I know who you are. Um, and I think um, since uh, Jimmy still hasn't come online, I think we can do a voice. Okay. Vote. Okay. Yeah. All right. So all in favor to approve the retiree resolution, say aye. Aye. Any um, opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you for your years of service. We also have a certificate for you. All right, moving on to item 11, which is FY24 budget and five-year plan update uh, as of October 27th, 2023. Mr. Farmer. Hello. Um, okay, the slides are not showing. We need to do that. Just waiting. All right. 
Um, and Chair, uh, we do have a Spanish interpreter here we now. Do. And it's Maria Avila. Great, thank you for being here, Ms. Avila. So if, um, if yeah. anyone needs Spanish interpretation, we can provide it. Uh, I don't know if you would like to make an announcement in Spanish, yeah. Maria, I'm here for any Spanish um, interpretation. Mi nombre es Maria y estoy aquí para los servicios de intérprete en español. Thank you for being here. All right, let's start. So um, I'm going to present some information here. Uh, some of it's new, some of it you've heard. Uh, you know, I'm not asking for an approval here at this point in time. This is really more informative. Approval down the road will come, but you know, yay or nay, but I'm bringing it up. So back in March, we presented the FY24 budget. Since then, we've done it again in May, and we did it again in June to get final budget. Since then, you know, we've settled with the union as well as management for COLAs and all sorts of different changes, so our base budget has changed. You know, we knew it was coming, and at that point, I want to kind of walk you through that real quick. But before I do it... I want to kind of level set here. We have three goals in mind as I go through this process. Recording this, in progress. As I go through this presentation. So these are three that Michael has mentioned you know, multiple times. And as we are, we're reimagining Metro. And in order to do that, you know, one of the things is 7 million trips uh, annually over the next five years. We also want to look at you know, zero emissions fleet, which we're very aware of, the 57 buses, hydrogen buses. And then, of course, you know, the 175 units over the next 10 years, this is housing. You know, those are the big three items and goals. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, currently our board approved budget right now on our operating surplus is $7.5 million. We've now layered in the COLAs and we've layered in all the different uh, various aspects, and we're trying to hold everything kind of somewhat flat. And like I said, this is base, base budget. <laughs> So kind of going to the next slide, uh, as you can see, $1.7 million of that is the COLA impact of the raises that we gave everybody. Uh, we had some other adjustments that have made because, like I said, we started this budget way back in February. And as we kind of go through, things change and directions change and, and strategic goals start coming up that we have to fulfill. So as part of that, um, we were talking about bus wraps. Caltip insurance bill we received. Net net is about $2 million in expense higher, and we're basically offsetting that with our 5307 grant, which is good. So net net, it's about $100,000 worse. And that's our level set budget if we do nothing. But as you remember, last board meeting, we approved phase one, and we had a heavy discussion around phase one and phase two. This is a reimagined metro in order to get the seven million riders and so forth of that nature, uh, you know, re-envisioning uh, all the services. So as part of that, you know, we're gonna move into our rollout of our phasing and another thing to bring up is free fares. So as part of going into this, you know, the first is, you know, phase one, which is a focus on like 15 minute frequencies, UCSC down to Santa Cruz, and that would take place here really at the end of December, but for purposes here, January of 2024. Phase two would start the rollouts, and this would be the rest of the county, uh, possibly in April of 2024. And as part of it, because we're making all these different changes, we're looking at doing free fares as part of it. So, you know, as we change these routes, add these frequencies and so forth, free fares throughout. And this would be a trial period, you know, for no more than like 12 months, possibly going longer, you know, if it works out. Um, as part of that too, what I'm gonna show you in here is 30, uh, 36 month period. And we do have funding for that. And as part of that, I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, in part of phase one, uh, each phase will require additional drivers, support personnel, and then approximately about 10 buses, maybe 12 buses, it depends, in order above and beyond the bus fleet that we have right now to be in service. 
Um, the money that we're going to look at to possibly cover all of this extra 36 months of phase one, phase two, free fares. Recording in progress. Is the TERSUP operating, and in, in this case, I'll just say a TERSUP grant that's about 34 to $35 million. $34 or $35 million that will actually cover us for the 36 months. And as possible, too, there's also some discussions with UCSC, too. So in phase one, you know, this is the one that was discussed at the last board meeting, which you approved. The impact over this 36-month period, and this would start in January of 2024 and go through to December of 2026. So it's 36 months. would have cost about approximately $3.8 million dollars and that would be in the service, above and beyond our base budget that I just showed. Phase two, on the other hand, would be a combination of $24 million of expense over the 36 months with additional help from UCSC of about $9.2 million. So the net of that is about $14.8 million to cover that over the 36 months. So the total between... Oh. between the total between phase one and phase two is $18.6 million. Remember, I'm still talking about the 34 that I have on the side. So this is 18.6. And that phase two, the cost is really driven is the fact that we need 50 more bus drivers as well as five transit supervisors and two mechanics in order to kind of make this happen. And that starts in April, by the way. And then the last one is our free fares. So as part of free fares, the free fares would start at the initial rollout in January of phase one, and that would cost about $10.7 million. So in that total is $29.3 million less than the um, current $34, $35 million that we'll receive in terms of, which then we could push on capital, the remaining portion. And this would cover us above and beyond our base budget. So this is actually a good thing. And just to kind of go in, one of the new concepts that I'm kind of bringing up right now on the table is this free fares concept. We've talked about phase one. We've talked about phase two. Now we're going to talk about free fares. So in free fares, you know, the benefits of this, just, you know, just right off the bat is, you know, there's shorter dwell times because now we can board at both, um, uh, we could actually get on the bus and off the bus on using both doors instead of coming on the bus in the front door and then exiting on the back door. You know, we don't have to worry about people collecting the fares. We don't have money transactions. We don't have the processing of that. We eliminate the TVMs. You know, we don't have the splash pass and the credit card transactions that you have to do on the bus. Um, there's no fare pricing or marketing activities that, that kind of goes away at that point. This also becomes very accessible to all the low-income people across, as well as students and seniors, because now they can just get on the bus and go, and they don't have to worry about struggling for change and cash to get on. Um, also, this is one more big item that drivers don't have to deal with, is getting on the bus and people not having the exact change, or for that matter, even any money to ride the bus. You know, they just get on the bus. And then, of course, all the maintenance and the equipment and the support personnel and so forth that's associated with running the fares and dealing with the cash is eliminated. We don't have to deal with it. Now, there is a flip side of this, and I think we've seen this before, you know, during COVID. You know, there are these people, you know, there's people who are destinationless ridership that we have to worry about. So as part of that, there would be additional security personnel who would ride our buses, you know, and making sure that they, you know, people feel safe and everything works well. So there is a cost associated with this. You know, the other thing too is if this thing really takes off, which we expect it to take off, and as I think Michael has mentioned before, at least in the finance committee, you know, you're talking about 30% pot potential increase or more when you add free fares, you know, when it comes in there that if we start filling these buses, even with all this frequency, we can leave people behind. Um, the other thing is uh, there's also the perception of, you know, for people out there, why do transit riders get to ride free? And I think, you know, that is a big question, and, and I don't have that answer for it, but what I can tell you is that, you know, if we're really going to 
into this society where we really want to help people and people get around and realize the cost of living here is very expensive and and people who are struggling, you know, to get them to and from the grocery store and in their jobs and so forth, you know, this is something that at least we can give back and help. And um, then, like I said, the biggest thing is the financial impact because we end up losing, you know, any type of payment that we receive, you know, in lieu of giving free riders. And by the way, this hits not just our buses, but it also hits our paratransit too as well. So if we go free on, on buses, we go free on paratransit. And then going to the next slide, um, you know, this is where I kind of want to talk talk through. So, for example, in the very top line, uh, our June 2023 budget over that 36 month period is about 13.7 million dollars positive. By adding in those general adjustments, where we're saying we're going to stay flat, but we also have these colas that are going to go in, that's really driving the, most of this cost increase. We drop to about $3.8 million. From there, when you layer in all these different phases, the phase one, phase two, uh, free fares, and some help from UC Santa Cruz, our impact is $29.3 million. Our new budget would be $25.5. We would completely offset that whole $29.3 million with this TERFs of funding. So effectively, so effectively, we'll be back to the $3.8 million. So this is our one-time shot. And we can't use that money just in general if we just have our base budget. We can't use it. It's about expanding service. It's about doing what phase one and phase two are trying to do. And how does, and how that, does that relate into our five-year plan? So in our five-year plan right now set up, you know, right now we're talking about, uh, you know, $5.9 million. And then, of course, it, it does increase. This does not include that funding that I just talked about for the 29.6. So coming across um, will actually be much better than what you see here. And then I think one of the bigger issues here, and I want to explain this, is, you know, what is, okay, there we go. So, what I did was, you know, this is a lot of money going out the door. What is it if we continue this beyond 36 months? How, do, what, how does that impact our cash deficit? You know, what's our physical cliff and so on? So we took, you know, and uh, basically modeled out into the future to about 2034 what we think it would be if we continue it. And one of the key caveats here is we need a sales tax to continue it. There is no if, ands, buts, or ors. It, no sales tax. We don't continue this, we shut down the program. But right now, the real issue is that we basically modeled out what we think the projection is going to be. You know, we don't know what inflation is going to be in 10 years, or for that matter, you know, even if we're in a recession, things kind of draw back. But we made our best estimates. And from there, before I go into the next one, I just want to remind everybody of these buckets. You know, at the very top, which is basically our workers' comp liability operations sustainability cash flow as well as our UAL OPEB, those are re kind of restricted buckets. Those are our restricted buckets. These buckets are what they are, and they're not part of this discussion about what, you know, where we hit negative in cash. And the reason why is this money is specific for specific reasons. It doesn't mean we can't free it up to use it for things, but it takes board approval and a lot of heavy conversation to do it. But think of this as not part of when I show you the cash aspect is part of that. However, the bus replacement, capital operating reserve, as well as the COVID recovery fund are part of the cash. As part of, we're drawing that down to keep in the operations going. So on the next slide, here's where if we do nothing, we keep the base budget. Very first slide I showed. As we go through, um, and there's no phasing, we don't do the phase one, we don't do the phase two, no free fares. We're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 2029 is where we're going to start running into negative cash. And if we start running into negative cash, we got to do something now. You know, I mean, at least start thinking through what do we want to do. However, now that we've talked about phase one and phase two, which is basically here, uh, the biggest thing is half cents sales tax. That, that's big key. You know, the free fares, they continue to go. Our sales taxes grow based off of pre-COVID years. 
you know, we need the help from UC Santa Cruz. And then of course, you know, all of this continues beyond the 36 months. You know, this is assumed sales tax, we continue this process. You know, we are at 100% of our personnel. We're gonna continue the COLA at 4% throughout. Even though I know before we usually take it away, but I mean, in theory, that COLA may be 3%, maybe 5%, it's not about negotiations. This is about just a projection to figure out where we are so we understand. And then inflation too as well. And what that does, if we go to a sales tax on the November 24 ballot, I know we'll receive money in 2025, but we're taking kind of a conservative approach and saying January of 2026, we're gonna start receiving it. So a year later, you know, everything kind of gets put in place. And from there, as you can see, the curve is actually pretty high and pretty healthy. And that will keep us you know, viable to probably 2040 if, if we do that. And this also, by the way, keeps all the phases in as well as the free fares. That's great news. You know, however, if we push to the sales tax ballot, um, you know, two years out from November 24 to November of 26, and then of course start collecting a year later in 2028, year 2028, as you can see that curve comes way down. And like I said, there's some little bit of negativity sitting there in 28, that's okay. I'm, we have that covered, you know, we have a little bit of flexibility in some of these numbers here. But ultimately that gets us all the way out to 2034, a decade later. So actually more than a decade, 11, 11 years later before we have to do anything. And so as part of that, um, basically it's really kind of moving forward with, you know, the phasing, the free fares. And then of course, you know, this is where we could demonstrate like a world-class system meet the goals that I talked about of, uh, at the very beginning, the three different goals. And then at the same point too, the biggest thing is, is the sales tax. As long as we get that sales tax, you know, that will really make us viable to keep moving forward. If we don't get the sales tax, then we would have to cut back to our base and then really look holistically on what we can do going forward beyond 2029, because as you saw the first chart, that's where we kind of fall and that's where we got to figure out what we need to do from there. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. Let's see if board members have questions or comments. Director Downing. Going back to the slide about assumptions of. Um, Which one? On, on here or way back? Yeah, way back. <laughs> it has to do with the free fares. Not, uh, oh, the free fares yeah. right here? So have you consulted other transit districts to reach some of these uh, some of these uh, numbers, have you, have you spoken with others to see if there is anything we're missing here on the uh, benefits and the challenges? Yeah, this is actually, most of these were driven off of another a transit agency's board report that went in to go to free fares. Or I will say, keep free fares, because there are already free fares, you know, versus going back to actually charging. Yeah, because sometimes they're just unintended consequences. That yeah. If somebody else has already done it, there's no reason for us not to know it ahead of time. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rodkin. So I wanted to comment on the big picture issues here. First of all, thank Chuck for the presentation. The numbers are critical. It has to pay for itself. It has to work. Um, we dream of being the best transit district in the country or one of the best. And this is a practical map of how we can actually get there. And when we ask for people for a sales tax, we're not asking for money because we're failing and we desperately need to have some help to stay afloat. We're saying, with your help, we could become a, a transit district that competes with Boulder and Portland and these places that people talk about as having wonderful transit systems. Um, the, to the, answer the question about the public asking, why, why do these people get to ride for free? You know, how come they get away with that? I, I think there are two major answers to that that I think will resonate with drivers that don't take the bus. One of them is, how can you get these other cars off the road? And how much would you pay to have people on a bus and, instead of having driving around in a, in a you know, several ton <laughs> vehicle? Because people are no longer driving one ton vehicles, they're driving much heavier stuff around on the roads. And climate change 
is an issue that people in this county have paid serious attention to, and it makes a difference when people get out of their individual cars and, and take public transit. And so we, I think we have to push hard on those kinds of issues. But I kept at, we had a presenta this presentation or close to it at the Finance Committee, and, and I, I asked the question there, how can we do this? The transit districts around this country are going under. They're having major crises and cutting back on service and BART talking about shutting down routes and frequency dropping dramatically and so forth. And the answer that I got from Chuck and from Michael Tree and others was other districts depend a lot more on their uh, fare, their fares from their riders for their, their uh, uh, financial success. And we're at about 20% of the money we get to run this system comes from people paying for their ticket, for their fare on the bus. BART, it's 60%. So if you ask why is BART in trouble, when COVID hit and people stopped taking public transit, or a lot of people stopped taking public transit, they took a huge hit in their budget. We took a hit, but it wasn't as dramatic, because we, because again, and what the difference is, people in this county have been willing since 1978 to tax themselves, to pay local funding, to keep a transit system operating at a level that really serves the public. That's critical because compared to other districts around the country, we have a lot better public support from the people in our community, whether they ride the bus or not, because the voters all have to vote on this, not just the bus riders. And it, it really makes a difference. So what, we, what we've had here are a bunch of numbers that show that it'll work, but I keep holding on to the bigger picture, sort of narrative description of what's going on. We're talking about becoming an amazing transit district, 15 minute service in the year one, from the university and 15 minute service throughout the county in, the, in phase two, um, free fares. I, I, I've been on this district um, board since uh, 1979 and I can't remember when that wasn't one of the biggest issues that members of the public got out. How come we can't ride for free or, you know, how, it's so, you know, we can't afford it or I take the bus but it's too much or I don't, I never have the right change. I don't, I, it's confusing and I don't know how you pay for it. And so, it would make such a difference just to say, if you want to get someplace, get on the bus. You don't, have to, you don't have to have the correct change. You don't have to go pay ahead of time 30 days to get a, a pass that'll take you on there or something. So I'm incredibly excited by what you've just presented to us. I mean, the numbers are just kind of dry, and that's our responsibility and your <laughs> responsibility to get into that and understand how they work. But for the public, the picture here is not about these numbers. It's about how a, really a reimagined bus system that really carries people where they need to go. And it's not just about public transportation, it's about housing. If you have 15 minute service that runs along Soquel Avenue, you can start and think about it all the way down Soquel, not just in the city of Santa Cruz, but all the way to, you know, to eventually Freedom Boulevard and down to Watsonville. The, the opportunities for affordable housing where you don't have to have uh, parking, pay a third of the cost of building the house, because you don't need two cars for every family or three cars. People can get on a bus. If the bus is coming every 15 minutes, you don't even have, you don't even have to know when it's coming. It's a, on an average a seven minute wait if you just go out there and hope it's coming soon. You know, seven minutes, is not, you're not really taking a huge punk out of somebody's life. So I think we'll be able to have a real increase in affordable housing on these routes. Um, public transit for people to get to hospitals and work and schools and places they need to be. I just think this is one of the most exciting things going on in this county right now. And I don't think we should underestimate that. And I think we, we can get the public to support this half cent sales tax if they understand that picture. It, it's not a, oh, we're desperate, we're going under and maybe give us a little more money and maybe we can hold on for, by our fingernails for another couple of months or something. No, we're talking about really having a wonderful transportation system here. So thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Director Rockford. Director Dorsford, did I see your hand up? Yeah. Um, awesome. <laughs> I'm very excited about this conversation and um, looking forward to how this rolls out. I do um, appreciate the efforts that are being made because at Cabrillo, we have a lot of tiers that I personally have to navigate through when I have my K through 12 get to ride for free and dual enrollment uh, 
and their bus passes, and then I have folks who are on paracruise, and then I have exempted students, and so then I have to charge all the other students the e extra fee. So it's nice to know that some of my accounting <laughs> efforts will be different, <laughs> and I appreciate that. I do want to know, you made a com there's a comment on the slide about the UC Santa Cruz contribution. I want to know if that's above and beyond the contract that we're already in and what d does that look like for the Cabrillo? Because our contract is not set to expire until 2025 and this will go into place in 2024. Yeah, so it is above and beyond what UCSC is contributing today uh, and it's about service. I think there's been discussions, you know, I think Scott's very well of it and, and I know Michael's been talking about it, but yes, um, there is addition to what's currently getting paid by UC Santa Cruz. And um, that's why I said that uh, we really need that help to make this happen. And the second part, the impact to the real? Um, we haven't got there yet. Thank you, Director Northcutt. Uh, I'll add, I, I think UCSC intends to, or at least imagine some of their service shifting from TAPS, their internal transportation system over to us, <coughs> which is why they can, not getting rid of all of it, but it, it, allow, it allows them to afford additional contribution because they yeah. won't have to put that into the TAPS uh, loop buses. And we, run the, we run the same place on campus and the loop buses and our buses. So that's one way that they can raise some additional funding. Plus, they do have some reserves at this point in their transportation budget. And we don't, but I'm happy to buy out the contract and, and be done because we have different types of agreements that if we go over, uh, if we collect more than what we owe, then we kind of pay the difference. And maybe we talk about that later, and I'm probably missing an email, but there's an option there sure. of us buying it out so that we kind of settle the difference mm -hmm. um, and get to be on the train of the free fare starting yeah. 2024. Yeah. It's a great marketing tool for community college students. Thank you. Other directors? Director yeah. Um, God help me if I, we get into a discussion on rail trail, but uh, uh, I think it's going to be a component in this discussion on our sales tax because people are talking about public transit and, of course, that issue hasn't been resolved and I think it's going to be uh, enlightening when the costs of it and whether the Coastal Commission will allow for the, I'm talking about the rail and so forth. I, um, I just, I was, I'm just begging for, I, a decision of what these costs and environmental impact of rail will be and if it's realistic that it can be a reality and believe me I'm not trying to get into an argument about this but I think it's going to be part of the discussion because without the rail they said well what are you going to do and this is what we're going to do with Metro to greatly improve our service um, so in some respects I think that could be a sales point but I don't think we're going to get that answer anytime soon and believe me Pardon me if I got on the rail trail deal, but I think it's going to have an impact on how we address this issue. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I think this is an incredibly exciting moonshot, if you will. Um, Metro's moonshot uh, really <clears throat> could create a world-class transit network for our community. Uh, and as has been said, it would be revolutionary, not just for the way <clears throat> people get around our community, but also for our ability to build more housing. Uh, and I have heard firsthand just this week from uh, a father of a, a student that's using the free fare program, and he says it's been life-changing because now instead of being all stressed out in the mornings rummaging around for, free, uh, for spare change uh, and sometimes, you know, not finding it and then having to drive uh, his, his high school student to wherever they need to go, he can rest assured they're going to be able to get on the bus. Uh, so I just have a couple of a quick questions. So first of all, um, when we look at that, that longer timeline through 2034, uh, the cash line, does that assume the free fares continue yes. uh, after we, we pass the sales tax? Yeah, okay. everything that's associated with kind of the 
all the way out to 2034 no. assumes we keep phase one, phase two, and all free fares intact. Okay. It does not stop after 36 months. All right. Um, and then the other question is, and I <coughs> hope that UCSE sees the benefit of this whole package uh, for operations on their campus. Um, but if they give less than um, we would you know, ultimately like, how could we modify this program to make it work? I mean, that is the one piece that is not fully within our control um, in, as a part of this plan, and it's, it's significant. So would we, <coughs> I mean, reduce the number of people who are eligible for free fares? Would we look at um, maybe reducing some of the frequency on certain routes? Or is that just sort of something we'd have to model out separately? Hi, Director Koenig. Uh, John Argo, Planning and Development Director. So we would, this phase two envisions uh, 12 buses an hour serving the UCSC campus in both directions. So a bus every five minutes in both directions. Uh, if UCSC doesn't see the benefit or doesn't contribute what, what Chuck has modeled, we would just reduce that service, commensurate with the contribution that we're modeling today. So essentially, it, it, it requires a shift in thinking. I mean, I think, it, and it somewhat applies to the Cabrillo contract as well, where it's, uh, there's this thought that they're paying for free fares, but really what it's paying for is service. Mm -hmm. And so if we reduce those contracts, it means we'd have to reduce service to the to both campuses. Right. Okay. Makes sense. And of course, the the free fares will improve the the service overall because people will be able to board front and back, and the bus will ultimately be more reliable as a result. Um, any any ideas what we would do beyond twenty thirty four? I mean, one thing that uh, is clearly we. we ultimately yeah, we, we haven't modeled beyond twenty thirty four, but as you can see, I think if we go to here, this is the one where we kind of kind of put our pencils down, and, and if we decide we are going to go with phase one, phase two, and free fares, at least for the 36 months, we are going to take more of a heavy scrub mm -hmm. at going beyond 2034, probably going to 2040 and beyond, probably a 20-year time frame. But really, it's, it's really around the magnitude of the economy, you know, that, that's really going to drive that because, you know, we know we're going to have... COLA adjustments for the most part for people, but you know, if, if the economy takes off and we have CPIs of five or six percent, that could blow our numbers out of the water, you know, where we're, we're losing money fast because everything's going up in price. But if it cuts back down to one percent, you know, we've modeled out and it's going to go actually farther. That's where it gets tough when you start getting way beyond 10 years. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. Yeah, it might be valuable to look at some of the other funding mechanisms as well that other agencies uh, around the world utilize. I mean, one that comes to mind is potentially the creation of transit funding districts, since ultimately, as has been said, uh, some of the folks that will benefit the most are those who are living in the new housing that we're able to create. So it would make sense to utilize that, leverage it, um, in order to ensure a s stable budget yeah. long into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Other directors? Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, oh. I just had a, a couple of comments, because this is a really good discussion. This is like a paradigm shift for Metro in a big way, right, in the community. Um, you know, I, I had uh, jotted down some notes. I think in regard to where do you go after 2034, you know, Chuck mentioned the economy, that's a big one, and Director Koenig. Uh, talked about alternative funding sources and rethinking how you pay for public transit. That's another, with benefit districts and so on. Uh, and we've had some discussions with LAFCO, thanks to a connection from uh, uh, board member Koenig in regard to just thinking out in the future, how do you sustain your public transit system, especially with uh, infrastructure and other needs. And I think the uh, state and the federal government are the other two huge pieces to what happens after 2034 because they, for the most part, pay for the majority of your system. They pay for your buses, they pay for your fueling station, they pay for your maintenance. And I, I really think there has been shifts in, in thought as to the importance of public transit, but you know that kind of ebbs and flows with, with politics. But I think that's a big factor in 2034 is where are the state and the feds in, in regard to support for public transit. Um, so 
I, I think that uh, I'm optimistic, right? Everybody likes to get behind a winner, and, uh, and I think public transit could be a real big winner as you move forward in Santa Cruz County. Um, we've talked about that ridership goal, and you know, John Ergo and I saw the path to get to seven million through the phase one and the phase two, because we, we just thought out of the box for a couple of weeks on how could we double ridership and get back to the top of where Metro had been. So phase one and phase two do that. And then um, fare free adds a whole new component into phase two. Um, in Missoula, uh, we took the system fare free first through a pilot, just like you're contemplating. And then actually it just became part of a ballot measure, which the uh, residents approved, but they approved it because they saw a 70% increase in ridership in Missoula. And so if you just got like a 50 or 60% ridership increase off of uh, fare free in a phase two environment, that's where you start to approach 10 million rides a year. I think really confidently you'd be probably at 9 million, but you'd be moving towards 10. And that is uh, rare air. I mean, for a system this size to be carrying that many people, all kinds of great things happen in a, in a county, uh, as Director Rotkin talked about, uh, efficiency of the transit system, uh, eco environmental impacts, uh, helping uh, free, uh, basically equity, right? Uh, your folks that can least afford good transportation now have great transportation, just like everybody else in the community. Transportation doesn't become as much of an issue for jobs, for important medical appointments, for, uh, for uh, really tight budgets. So there's just a lot of things that flow and a lot of things to think about um, in regard to phase two and fare free you would not even be able to remotely contemplate going on phase one and phase two and fare free if it wasn't for one time TERSIP grant of $28 million. That gave you the opportunity to do this for three years. It's one time money. And so uh, as that money comes before the RTC commission, you should defend that at all costs. That is Metro money. It's, its intent from the governor was to provide funding to build ridership for the public transit agency in the region to help with any deficits that might be there and to finish up zero emission bus projects. So there's 28 million and there's 7 million. Don't let anybody else get their fingers on that. I'm, because that is your golden moment to show for the next three years what a world-class transit system looks like. And then you could take that if you desire, you know, to the voters uh, or find some other mechanism. And, you know, they'll have seen what it is and can make a good conscience vote on whether they'd like to continue that in your county. So I think the Finance Committee will continue to work. Uh, the ad hoc committee that was set up by your chair will meet again and talk about the ballot measure and make some recommendations for the board that would be forthcoming in the real near future. I would like to say in regard to the fare free uh, slash benefit and challenges slide that Chuck put up, that the, the one thing that's not there that we experienced in Missoula and that most would would definitely make a comment on is if you take your fixed route system fare free, you also need to take your, your uh, paracruise system fare free. And Chuck has uh, skillfully budgeted in the numbers that you have seen here today, increases for paracruise to accommodate the fare free environment. But over the long term, that's the one where you'd wanna watch very closely your costs because uh, uh, that's a really expensive uh, system to provide. But to be honest with you, when you go to the voters, that's probably one of your biggest sound bites is, uh, and one of the biggest supports for a potential ballot measure or whatever you're looking for is taking care of your seniors and your disabled. And so generally speaking, you're able to keep pace with that just uh, by talking to the public about it. But we did want to, in case it was in the back of your mind, recognize that uh, your senior and disabled service, your door-to-door -door pair crews is budgeted also for increases within these numbers. Thank you, Mr. Tree. And um, I'll add some comments. I, I made these comments at our Santa Cruz City Council meeting this week, but there are a lot of eyes on us, um, national, state, um, as is apparent with the grants that we've gotten and the 
um, events that we've had. So there are a lot of eyes on us. And as, as you mentioned, Mr. Tree, that people do like to get behind winners. And this is our opportunity to shine. So um, I'm really excited. This, this is beyond transportation. It is about equity. It is about environmental sustainability. And it's about overall community well-being. So um, thank you so much for laying out a path for us to, to make it there. Great. Right. OK, so we'll move on to, um, speaking of paths to get us it, there, we'll move on to agenda me, Chair, item 12. Yes? Um, could we pause for a moment? Our technicians are having a little glitch here sure. and so that we can get that uh, taken care of before the next item. No problem. And All that right. is the Pacific Station update. Thank Metro you. Metro Downtown Transit Center. We're good. Okay. Yeah, we're back on. Hello, Mr. Okay. Ergo. Let's 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 see it. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, John Ergo, Planning and Development Director. So I'm here to give an update on the Pacific Station uh, progress to date and request your review and approval of the temporary operations plan. Uh, the City Council, Santa Cruz City Council, approved this plan on Tuesday of this week, and as part of the MOU uh, that we have with the city. Uh, we need to review and, and ask for your approval of the plan as well. So Pacific Station, of course, has been a partnership uh, with the City of Santa Cruz, uh, with For the Future Housing, Eden Housing, and has cobbled together multiple uh, funding sources to get us to where we are uh, today. Uh, we received a $29 million grant from the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program of the state, an infrastructure grant, sales tax credits uh, for the affordable housing, and of course, Metro's contribution of $4 million. Um, and what we're talking about today is really uh, in support of this plan to redevelop Pacific Station into 128 units of affordable housing, which include 32 extremely low-income units, 63 very low-income units, 31 Section 8 project-based units, uh, and two manager units, and of course, a new modern state-of-the-art transit center. Uh, so the, I am uh, not planning to get uh, too much into the weeds, well, I'll go as as far into the weeds as you all want on the plan, the circulation patterns, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into the weeds alone though, so you'll guide me how far we wanna go in. But everything I'm gonna talk about today is meant to be temporary as we move our current operations from where they are uh, to where they're going to be for the next two years, give or take, while construction and, and demolition happens at the current site. Uh, and uh, I will just run into the map of the new site. So, so current Pacific Station and future housing, new tarmac and temporary operations center. So we're looking at the block bounded by uh, Front Street, River Street South and Soquel. And the key elements of this plan include a temporary revised uh, transit circulation patterns, pavement restriping, uh, a clockwise pattern around this block, so all routes uh, will circulate uh, clockwise, conversion of River Street South to one-way southbound with a contraflow uh, bike lane parallel to the levee path, uh, and a front street shared bus bicycle lane to facilitate bus movements, and a new temporary uh, ticket sales call center at 603-605 front. And uh, we're 
in bid package development right now. It's actually complete. Um, assuming approval, we will advertise it uh, later this month. Well, the city will. The city is the lead on, on both the project, the Pacific Station development and the temporary operations facility. Okay. Uh, we'll look to start shifting operations in January, uh, but the project needs to break ground in February. So by February 1st is when we plan to be operating out of this new uh, temporary transit facility. Okay, so is there a laser here? Just, just a note, there, there was a mistake on the last slide that is January and February 24. Did we not change the years? Yeah. Okay. We'll be sure to change the years yeah. going forward. <laughs> not moving backwards. <laughs> it's, a, it's a leap year. Um, so here's the site plan layout. The red on front line, on front street, is the shared bus bike lane. It's a 13-foot facility, uh, except for around the bus stops where it's 15-foot, which creates space for cyclists to pass uh, buses at the bus stops. Um, the primary loading areas will be at the existing stop that's uh, by CVS on Front Street, uh, just north of Soquel. At the existing stop, that's a pullout uh, on Soquel in between Front Street and River Street South. And we'll install, the plan is to install a new stop at River Street South, uh, just north of Soquel. And the whole point of uh, the, the strategy behind the bus stop relocation, or the bus stop layout that way is so that any transfers that are occurring in the system are happening at the same stop. So if you're a UCSC uh, passenger customer coming up on the 1819, you're, you'll pull into that Front Street stop at CVS. If you're continuing south or to the San Lorenzo Valley on the 35, all of that activity will happen at that stop. Same thing on the other side. So it's meant to create maximum convenience uh, for our customers. Those are the two, essentially, uh, in-service bus stops. There'll be one on Front Street, uh, one on River Street South, and then, not shown here, but the 17 and 35 will use the pullout uh, on Soquel between Front and River Street. Um, we currently have layover space and bus stops in, in Pacific Station for 25 buses, and so, we are looking to uh, recreate that around uh, this block, which necessitates using all of it, essentially, on the inside of the block. So uh, we are going to be temporarily removing all of the on-street parking uh, around this entire block. Um, on the front street side of it is where we'll be implementing that shared bus bike lane. On the, but some of it may, be need, may need to be used as layover space. On the back side, River Street South is where primarily the layover locations will be, um, but we, we will just need all of that space uh, during the interim period. I'm not Matt Starkey, but he did pre prepare this presentation for the city, uh, and that's, that's really it. So if there are questions on the circulation and the map, I'm happy to get into it, uh, but this is the plan as we've prepared. Thanks. Thank you. Director Rodkin. I, I oh. assume somebody's looked at the parking impacts from removing all this on-street parking and that there is space available in the garages or something, you know, or is it just like, well, good luck. <laughs> How much work has gone into thinking about that? Yeah. Because go there's a bunch of stores and yep. restaurants and destination areas down there that people park at and without all, if that parking's all gone, it's, it's tight now. Yeah. The, the, the on-street parking at River Street South is not heavily utilized. It's primarily the front street spaces that are the main concern. Uh, the city staff have done an audit of the two parking garages, one that's on the front in Soquel and the other one that's in the top of the middle of the block. There's plenty of capacity. The issue is incentivizing or encouraging people to, to use that. And so the Transportation and Public Works Committee directed staff to come back with a plan uh, for encouraging that use and also for a constant assessment and update on the parking impacts. So of public the education about where to park or something. Yeah. You actually spend some money to let people know where the parking is going to yeah. be. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Dr. Koenig. So, <clears throat> as far as the transfers, 
are those mostly just going to be happening kind of at the CVS side of this, or will there be some cases where people would actually? So my understanding is those those are the three main stops. Um, would someone be transferring, you know, completely across this vertically or horizontally? No one will need to be transferring completely across unless you needed to get back to where you had just come from. So the 18 and 19 will become the UCSC routes 18 and 19 and 20 will be coming up Front Street, stop at CVS. That essentially will be the last in-service stop. Well, they the, they will circle the block, and their true last in-service stop will be at River Street South. That same location, CVS, will be the first in-service stop of the what will be the one and the two, what currently are the 71, 69 AW. Um, the 35 will also pick up there, the 17. So all routes will pick up there heading out of downtown. Uh, and same thing and going in the other direction, all of those routes will serve the new stop at River Street South as their last in-service stop, uh, which will be the first in-service stop of UCSC. So bottom line is all of the connections will happen at the same location. Great, thank you. Yeah. Director Downey. So how long do you think this will, do you have any estimates at this point? I know it's early. I mean, we think two years, but two to three years, I would say. Fingers crossed, all goes well. Other questions or comments? Thank you so much for the work on this. Thank yeah. you for the partnership with the city. It will be a uh, time of transition. So again, I said this, Tuesday afternoon, but we'll have to be patient with ourselves and with each other as a community. Um, and this this is the this is the way forward to get us to where what the presentation that we just saw. So yeah. appreciate all the work that's gone into this um, over the months and years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Is there public comment on this item? Anyone who wishes to speak on this item? Okay. Anyone online? No. All right. Bring it back for a motion. Second. I don't know who was first. <laughs> Rodkin was first. I think Koenig maybe was second. And um, do we need to do roll call? Or can uh, we just? Let's see. We, I think we can do the a voice. OK. So all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes. Great. Thank you. OK, item 13 is federal legislation update. Oh, excuse me. Yep, federal legislation update from Mr. Giglio. Welcome. Thank thanks you. Thanks for making it to Santa Cruz. Yes, thanks, uh, Chair Kalantari Johnson and uh, Vice Chair Brown and directors. It's great to be in Santa Cruz in Watsonville, uh, in Santa Cruz County here. Uh, and getting away from Washington. I uh, sent my uh, slide yeah, presentation to forward. Donna a couple of weeks ago, and just a couple of things have happened in the interim in Washington. <laughs> so <laughs> I may have little updates. Is there? Is this going to get uh, me? Do you move it forward on the right-hand yeah. right side? There you go. I also am not Matt Starkey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so just a few things that I wanted to go through, uh, you know, kind of in addition to kind of, again, what's, what's been going on in the House. But uh, the FY 2024 uh, DOT budget, uh, the uh, federal fiscal year, technically started on October 1 of this year. But, uh, of course, we do not have a finalized budget. That's not new. Congress hasn't done that in about 25 years. Uh, the IIJA, or as the President calls it, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the five-year bill that reauthorized transportation programs and also created some new programs. Uh, so I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on that. And then the overall 118th Congress uh, next year is the second session of the, of the two sessions of the 118th Congress. So just kind of give you a little bit of a highlight about that. So FY 2024 budget, as I mentioned, started uh, the budget technically uh, the year started on October 1. We don't have a budget enacted. Again, like I said, not uh, unusual. Congress has not met that October 1 deadline for the past 25 years. I believe this is 26 years now that they haven't met that 
uh, deadline. Uh, and so what, what is needed in these cases is a stopgap uh, funding measure, which we call a continuing resolution, that keeps the government open and it essentially funds agencies at their current levels. So we don't have a government shutdown, but what also a CR kind of does is, is it holds everybody kind of, nobody wants to do anything big during a CR because they know that that's not their final budget. Uh, and they could potentially get cut or maybe they get increases. Uh, and so uh, it kind of holds everything steady at these agencies, but they're not moving forward. And so, of course, we would rather have this, this uh, budget. Unfortunately, the House, the Republican-led House and the Democrat-led Senate are pretty far apart on their FY 2024 budget proposals. So for example, uh, the budget is made up of 12 bills that fund the various agencies and Congress tries to take them up individually. Uh, the bill in the House that funds the Department of Transportation, it also funds HUD and some other kind of related smaller federal agencies. Right now the House is proposing about a 25% overall cut to that bill. Uh, and uh, and uh, while the Senate is proposing kind of level funding near FY 2023 a little bit more. So very far apart there uh, on that. Uh, I also wanted to add, and I may have talked about this before, it's kind of a bugaboo with me, but we, we have heard uh, on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, that they want to concentrate a little bit more on deficit reduction in the years to come. Uh, the problem with that is that right now, 60% of the U.S. budget is uh, annual budget takes up uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, things like that. Another 10% is about interest on the debt. Another 20% of that, maybe a little bit less, is defense. And then 15% of that is what we call non-defense discretionary spending. And that's really where most of Congress is looking to find these very, very ambitious deficit reduction goals. They're only looking at that tiny 15% of the budget, and that includes the US DOT budget. And so we worry about these deficit reduction discussions that don't include uh, everything. I, th I saw something in the New York Times, uh, somebody, somebody said the US government is like a, a giant insurance company with an army. Uh, you know, when you talk about that entire budget. So, so anyway, so, that, so just wanted as by way of background, when you hear about this deficit reduction stuff in Washington, in a lot of cases, they're talking just about that, that pretty small um, slice of the, of the federal budget. The good news about the US DOT budget, while that there is a 25% proposed cut uh, overall for that bill that funds DOT and HUD in the House, uh, the formula programs, the 5307 formula program that funds a lot of uh, the transit operations here, uh, would be sort of held harmless. The, if you recall, the, uh, the IIJ or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law authorized funding from FY22 through FY26 for those formula programs. Both the House and the Senate sort of stay with those authorized levels, which would be about a 2 to 3% increase, I believe, uh, over FY23 levels. So I think we're pretty good there. Uh, you've probably heard me use the goofy budget term in the past, plus ups, and that is where Congress will provide, and in, in recent years has provided a little bit more money to those authorized levels from the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, in the past. So the bus program, the bus discretionary grant programs and all those things got little plus ups. This year, I think those plus ups are gonna be harder to get. Again, sort of trying to keep the budget steady. The, the House has none of those plus ups. The Senate has some pretty small plus ups. Uh, and uh, with, with regard to DOT, uh, uh, the, the heavy um, victims of, of proposed cuts in the House bills are, are Amtrak, uh, what they call the Capital Investment Grants Program. They used to call it New Starts. That funds light rail and BRT projects uh, and some other FRA programs. Those are the big culprits of the cuts at uh, USDOT. Like I said, the formula programs, the programs that were authorized in the IIJA overall are protected, so it's not all uh, bad news. Uh, this budget impasse that we're at sort of has its, de has its roots in the debt limit deal that was, uh, that was agreed upon earlier this year where, um, where uh, Congress agreed to essentially freeze uh, the, budget, the annual budget for FY24 and FY25 uh, in exchange for allowing that debt limit to be increased and we wouldn't default on, on some of our uh, uh, responsibilities. What the House did was they took that debt limit deal agreement as a, um, as a ceiling and not a floor. And so they comp 
composed their FY 2024 budget using a, 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 an overall budget level that was significantly less than what was agreed upon in that budget deal. The Senate took it more literally, and they've been using, you know, using a budget uh, at that higher level. So it's going to be difficult to break this log jam. And, and I say here the new, new House leadership won't likely break that log jam. I think it's going to be very difficult uh, uh, to do. Um, and, uh, and again, this, this one's actually a little bit of a change. I, I, two weeks ago, I thought the likelihood of a shutdown on November, a government shutdown on November 18th was very high because this new House leadership might not be interested in it. Um, but from all the reports we hear, the new Speaker of the House has, um, uh, has you know, gotten his caucus around uh, the idea of another CR at the very least, and this one would be a longer term CR through either January or April. Uh, of next year to allow more um, uh, negotiations on the budget. So good news that this new speaker doesn't want to shut down the government and his caucus seems, is, the Republican caucus seems to be behind this. The bad news is I think that they want that extra time to really try to squeeze hard uh, on, on implementing that 25% cut to the HUD DOT budget and, and others. So, um, so it's going to be a, a messy next few months uh, with regard to the budget. I think the Senate and the White House are going to hold firm uh, on, on that debt limit deal ceiling. Uh, and so we'll see. Uh, I, 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 I don't know where we're going to, where we're going to, what's going to happen, but I think for a lot of agencies, you know, like, again, a 25% cut is, is bad. So in, even if you meet them halfway, on that, you've still got a 12.5% cut, uh, which is pretty significant to a lot of agencies. Again, going back to the fact that I, knock on wood, our formula program money is, um, is probably in pretty good, pretty good hands. So the infrastructure law, 2021 IIJA, we've got probably years one and two of the five years worth of funding kind of on the street, either with uh, awards that were given and, or uh, notices that are currently out there for, for people to apply to. Um, I think the White House is trying very hard uh, while you know, things get messy in Congress, what they do is they roll out money, uh, you know, for, for various programs, uh, and, uh, and I think they're happy to do that. I uh, just wanted to kind of give you, you know, again, kind of an idea of the high profile funding. You know, these are, these are uh, bees, you know, billions of dollars that, that are given away annually. It's pretty historic, uh, unprecedented for all of these programs. Um, on the other hand, they are all oversubscribed. <laughs> you know? And so when you hear, oh, there's all this infrastructure money out there, billions and billions of dollars, yes, the needs far, far outweigh what we even have. And so, for instance, the $1.2 billion annually for the low and no emissions vehicle program and, you know, the $20 million that you folks were able to secure this year was just, you know, fantastic. And, and I wouldn't say that, oh, well, they got a billion dollars. Of course you got some money. This was highly, high, highly competitive oversubscribed, lots of real um, uh, thoughtful strategy by Mr. Tree and his staff putting together this, uh, getting the congressional delegation on board for it. It was, uh, it was a very, very heavy lift and a really impressive uh, a really impressive outcome. So a couple of the other programs are, you know, um, Santa Cruz County and, and Santa Cruz Metro be benefits from too with a, that mega grant that was a, the Highway 1 um, uh, award that was from earlier this year. Uh, the Safe Streets uh, and Roads is a kind of a pedestrian safety program that a lot of uh, uh, entities in Santa Cruz County. So, so a lot of that money is, is coming into Santa Cruz, Ca Cruz County through most, a lot of it through Metro, but through other, through other ways. As I mentioned before, the IIJA provides funding for federal uh, authorizes programs at DOT for the next five years, so through 2026, uh, and, and those competitive programs as well. So as far as transportation reauthorization, we've got a little bit of time, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later about how maybe it's never too early to discuss these things. Uh, we have found that um, we, the White House in their, you know, awarding of these programs, they continue to feel very, very strongly about uh, Buy America uh, requirements uh, with regard to purchasing U.S. Uh, uh, domestically uh, uh, produced uh, things. Uh, and permitting, uh, environmental permitting and, and uh, things like that. Again, the DOT uh, priorities, again, if you look at the awards that they've given out, very heavily, um, um, you know, 
focused on, on issues with regard to safety, modernization, climate, uh, equity, uh, and also equity with regard to geograph geographic uh, distribution. That's been something that they've care quite a bit about. Uh, here's uh, just again overall uh, just a reminder we've got in the House we've got a pretty slim Republican majority uh, we also have a very slim Democratic majority in the Senate and that will continue into uh, 2024 uh, adding on top of that the idea that it's an election year is going to make things probably pretty messy with regard to legislating I would predict that you know again sort of the budget the FY 2025 budget will be a focus and kind of a quote-unquote must pass Maybe not a lot else we'll be able to get done uh, next year uh, on that line. Uh, again, the budget battles will continue. As I mentioned before, the White House, again, kind of has this benefit of allowing Congress to kind of fight over things, uh, but they've still got this uh, IIJA and the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, which uh, includes a lot of uh, climate change uh, tax credits and uh, some programs at EPA. So they'll continue to be able to implement that and award money uh, while Congress fights. Uh, I would also say that it's probably even though uh, we're funded, the DOT is funded through 2026, and I and in listening to these really impressive uh, presentations that you know both Chuck and John are, are giving, you know about kind of these out years, right? What happens past 2026? I don't think it it is too early to start talking to our congressional delegation, Congress, uh, you know DOT about what happens in this next authorization, with this you know with the deficit reduction being sort of very you know, um, close to a lot of members of Congress, keeping those levels, that, those authorized levels from the budget, uh, from the bipartisan infrastructure law as the baseline for the next five-year authorization is really important. We want to grow on what we, you know, continue to have as opposed to people saying, well, you got your, you know, you got your chunk in the, in the infrastructure bill. Now we're going to start ramping down. I have not heard that, but I think that we need to, you know, talk about the needs out there. And I think, again, uh, the, uh, the proposals that, uh, that staff have put forward today uh, are a great starting point to educate our delegation and Congress that um, there's more to be done. Uh, on these things. So uh, I think that was all I had. I'm happy to answer any questions or anything I missed. Um, but uh, thank you again for your time. It's, it's uh, fantastic to be here. Thank you. Questions or comments? Director Ogden. So I'm a news junkie and do my best to follow what's going on in D.C. and I'm still always confused <laughs> when I'm done. And I have to say your presentations to us once or twice a year really help. So Recently, for example, yep. we got, we heard the news that the Biden administration has agreed to support hydrogen uh, station development in California. Yes. Big number. Big, big. $1.2 billion. So the first thing California. I want to do is thank you for your, in general, your lobbying work for us because I don't take it for granted. We have a really good congressional delegation, but yeah. <laughs> someone has to pull that together and direct that at the right people in Congress, and that's your job, and we really appreciate the results we've been getting. So thank you for your thank work. You. A small, to, to us, small amount, maybe large to you, I don't know, uh, that we pay you for doing that work is well worth it. It's, it this is not money we're just sort of throwing out there. It, it makes <laughs> a difference to us in the bottom line. Um, but so I'm trying to figure out, in the middle of this mess, have the House can't act, or apparently can't act, um, is it that, that there's an authorization bill that took place in 22 that that's the money that Biden's playing with when he says, here, here's several billion dollars for this or that or whatever. That's money that won't become a crisis until 26, even if Congress doesn't do anything this year. Am I right? Correct. I wouldn't say, I, 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 a lot of people call it guaranteed money. I don't know if it's guaranteed. guaranteed Congress guaranteed. could go back and, 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 you know, in annual appropriations between now and 2026, cut some of that money, but it's pretty unprecedented. Those, those transportation authorizations seem to hold with, with every Congress, uh, and very few times will they go back and do that. I think only in a, it would be, have to be a real budget emergency for them to go back and do that. With regard to the formula programs, the, and, and I think that the White House is going to be very protective of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the new programs and the increased funding that was included in that outside of the, uh, the authorized formula programs. And so I could see if Congress was to bring him something that was going to cut those programs significantly, he would probably veto it. So to ask it again, just to be really clear. Yeah. 
let's say nightmare scenario, they they can't pass a budget, a continuing resolution. They it just doesn't happen. They can't agree on anything. Yeah. It's just too. There's no reason for us to think that our formula money would be cut till 26. There's no reason to. I mean, again, it could happen, but right. I think that it would be it would be rare for them to do for, to do that. Yeah, and I think again, probably you know, a wor you know, I don't know if it's a worst case scenario, but like that year long continuing resolution. It actually happened uh, during the Obama administration where Congress just couldn't come together on a budget, and they did a year long CR, and as everything was kind of funded at their current levels. So what we wouldn't get if we did the t the year long CR was we wouldn't get that kind of two percent increase in the formula programs that's Plus built into twenty four. But it would, again, it wouldn't be a, a huge cut. And to what extent does the Biden administration have the ability to move money forward to, towards now? It, you know, it's funded for five through 26. Right. Could they take all the money? I mean, it wouldn't be wise, but take all of the money to 26 and fund, spend it all this year. Do yeah, my, my understanding is they can they can go backwards, and they have in some of these programs that were new programs created in the infrastructure law. They've done you know uh, uh, you know this year they would do an FY22 and FY23 notice, uh, and so they could go back if they haven't spent it. But I don't think that they're able to. I think still technically, con you know, a, a a a budget has to be enacted for that year for for the DOT to go and and make those awards. So they couldn't kind of bunch it all up into one. But do they need Congress to act for them to be able to do that in a given year? I don't think. Back to my first question. Yeah, I don't think they. they I, I don't think under under CR. I believe the DOT can still award that. It can still award that money on a competitive basis as well. As that, without a new appropriations bill of any kind or continuing. Right. Yeah, I think again, it would, the Congress would have to be very, very specific in a CR, which they try not to do. They try to make it as clean as possible and sure. not do a lot of policy changes in those. Thanks, and thanks again for your work, Chris. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions, Director um, Downing? So in 2016, we voted to tax ourselves to do some grant matching uh, applications, and I'm thinking about the potential for this next um, opportunity. Are there going to be, is that something that we can propose in the selling of this, uh, of this uh, ballot measure because in the future, you know, if we have, if we can match grants, what's our, what's the possibility that we'll be able to add to the, to the revenue that you were talking about outside of this, of this ballot measure? Yeah, I think, I think that measure was really important in, you know, in sort of showing Washington the, the self-help uh, kind of aspect of, of, of things in Santa Cruz County. So I, I, I can't discount that as being part of the success again of that that Lono uh, application earlier this year and, and, and ones going forward. There are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of entities that come forward and say, hey, we just don't have the match and they're kind of at the mercy of the DOT and sometimes they might go along with it, but other times they say, boy, they don't have any skin in the game. So uh, I think it's an important, fair, I think it's been very important and will be future. So, and it, and it makes sense, you know, as you're selling things going forward that this is, this is something that uh, that's been a benefit. Um, yeah, I'd just like to repeat what uh, Director Rodkin said about your effectiveness back there. It's uh, it's really remarkable, and I just want to say to our our from uh, our Jim uh, Mr. Tree on down, it's it's remarkable. It's unbelievable what we've been able to attain obtain uh, in the recent years yes. and this last year in particular. <laughs> it's Boy, I'm glad we got it when we did. And uh, it's the uncertainty of everything right now is, uh, is really troubling. But uh, thank you for everything you have done. Um, and it's really good to uh, learn about the hydrogen uh, issue about the stations and all. I hope that we can take full advantage of that as well. And uh, just thank you and everybody and the staff on down. Uh, I, I just don't know how we did it. It's remarkable. <laughs> so it's, uh, thank you very much for everything. All right. Thank you so much for all the work, as my colleagues have said, and thank you for coming out here to Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Appreciate Great to it. be here. Appreciate your time. Great. Okay, we'll move on to our next item, which is agenda item 14, state legislative update. 
Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Madam Chair and Directors, I'm Michael Pimentel, legislative uh, and regulatory advocate with the with Shao Yura and Tuisha Melzer and Lang, uh, here today to provide uh, to you a year-end state legislative update. And before I jump into my prepared presentation, I just want to reflect that much like the success at the federal level, this has been a banner year for Santa Cruz Metro in our state capital. Uh, as you know, well, this year delivered for the agency uh, its first Transit Inner City Rail Capital Program grant, uh, just under $40 million to move your hydrogen uh, bus program forward. Of course, also includes a variety of other elements that I'll touch on in just a moment. Uh, but you also did receive new legislation, uh, which has been topic of discussion this morning, uh, that would actually authorize you to move forward with a new local option sales tax, a transaction and use tax, uh, and provide you all uh, with some greater operational support in the years ahead. Uh, now, I do want to just acknowledge that much of that success, I think, owes to the progressivism of this board, uh, the work that you had done uh, early in the tenure of CEO Tree to outline the priorities for the agencies. And I think there are a lot of ways in which the priorities that you have identified for this agency align well, have congruency with the direction of the state, primarily at the California State Transportation Agency, California Resources Board, and that is why we have seen the level of uptake and respect for the agency uh, in this last year. Uh, and then finally, before I jump into the formal program, I want to just remark that CO Tree has taken a very direct role in engagement in Sacramento, meeting with your legislative delegation, meeting with the state agencies and departments, and really building that through line between the work that's happening here at the local level and again, those statewide priorities. And so I'm gonna to touch on some of those successes as I move through today's pro program, or rather presentation. Uh, but what I'm also gonna highlight for you are a variety of process and then uh, big successes, albeit from a broader statewide perspective uh, throughout this presentation. And so as a matter of process, we'll just note that the state legislature has been on recess since September 14th. And when they adjourned for that recess, uh, that was ending the first year of the two-year legislative session. They will be back in Sacramento on January 3rd for the start of the second year of the two-year legislative session. Now, after the adjournment on September 14th, that did kick off a 30-day period for Governor Newsom to evaluate all bills that were provided to him in the final weeks of legislative session. Now, in total, not just in the final weeks, but over the course of the year, he reviewed over 1,000 bills. He signed 890 of them. And so he had a rough effective rate of vetoing 15% of the bills uh, that crossed his desk. Uh, many of the vetoes uh, that were issued related to bills that would create new cost pressures on the state in a period where we've just gone past a $30 billion budget deficit. As we look out ahead, we know there will still be some additional uh, budget challenges for the state. He did not want to create new pressures on the budget, box in the legislature and his administration on what they could do in the years ahead to resolve the budget, and hence many of those vetoes. And as you'll see in my presentation, there were several bills that were put on ice because it would have created some budget pressures. His administration intervened, talked to the legislators and said, if you send that bill to me, I'll veto it. Many put those bills on hold. Now, there's been some major developments in the state capitol relative to legislative leadership. Uh, we have seen the transition uh, in both houses uh, and the ascension of two new leaders. Uh, in the assembly, we've seen the ascension of assembly member Robert Rivas uh, to the role of the speaker of the California State Assembly. It's notable, of course, because he's a member of the Metro legislative delegation. Uh, and we've also seen on the Senate side the ascension of Senator Mike McGuire uh, to the role currently uh, President Pro Tem designee or designate. He will be assuming the role of Senate President Pro Tem at the start of next year. Now, why this is remarkable beyond just the reality that Mr. Rivas is a member of your legislative delegation is, is that it's the first time in decades that we've seen a non, I should say, non-large uh, urban legislators take the helm of their respective houses. 
it has been for many decades a uh, matter of musical chairs between LA region, San Francisco Bay, and San Diego. You'd have to go back to the most recent example of, of Cruz Bustamante from Fresno being the head of the California State Assembly, where we'd have a smaller than large urban uh, representative heading these houses. And so what that means is that we're likely to see a reorientation in the considerations that the houses assert on matters of transportation expenditures, housing, many other areas of policy to recognize what are the needs of smaller urban areas, rural areas of our state, uh, and that may pro provide some balance to, again, what has long been the dominance of LA, San Francisco, Bay Area, and San Diego. Now I'm gonna touch on the Budget Act of 23-24 because this is one area where, stepping back, this was a success for the broader California transit industry, the transit agencies across the state, and that will deliver some meaningful benefits uh, to Metro. So the Budget Act of 23-24 uh, was something that included a variety of components. There's some transit funding, there's statutory relief and accountability requirements. I'll go into detail on what those mean uh, in particular. And then there was a base of infrastructure streamlining proposals that were advanced by Governor Newsom and then ultimately taken up and resolved uh, by the California State Legislature. And as I launch into precisely what we received in terms of transit funding, what I want to acknowledge is that as we started this year, the level of funding that was provided to California transit agencies was not in any way preordained. The reality is that we entered a year with, again, $30 billion budget deficit. Governor Newsom led out with a January budget where he had proposed to make a $2 billion cut to the state's transit interstate rail capital program, which would have had cascading impacts to regions and agencies across the state. And what ultimately resulted in the success this year, which again I'll go over in just a moment, was the advocacy of California's transit industry largely organized by the California Transit Association of which Metro is a member and their direct engagement with the legislature on a daily basis to emphasize the importance of those investments moving forward. So with regards to funding, much of that is captured, I should say all of it is captured under AB 102 it's what we refer to in Sacramento as a budget bill junior. It's a bill that makes adjustments to the main budget bill. And what it did was it restored against that, again, threat of a $2 billion cut, the $2 billion for the Transit Intercity Rail Capital Program that restored that program's capacity, a two-year capacity, to $4 billion. And that is also historic, not only because of the funding levels, but because it is the first time the state has actually committed state general fund dollars to supporting these types of major capital programs uh, here at the state level. Now I'll note for you that the money for the TIRCP, uh, as I'll refer to it because it's a bit uh, more abbreviated than the longer name, uh, would flow out through a new structure. Normally TIRCP is a competitive grant program. The four, roughly $40 billion, million dollars that you received this year was from that competitive end of the TIRCP. This will be a formula distribution. And it goes out to all regions based on population. And it includes, for the first time, this also part of uh, the store of the advocacy of the association, some flexibility to use that money, general fund supported, formula based, for operations. And so in instances where transit agencies have dire fiscal situations, like SF BART, you can flex that money toward resolving those issues as you also consider your capital program needs. There was also then the addition of $1.1 billion for the Zero Emission Transit Capital Program. These monies also flow through a formula basis, move through population and revenue, uh, and a structure, a formula that is consistent with the State Transit Assistance Program in its distribution. This money too, while it is ostensibly for zero emission transition, vehicles and infrastructure, can also be flexed for operational needs. Now for this agency, and I should say for this region, the total uh, level of investment will be about $35 million over four years. Uh, we'll note that uh, there's a typo here. It should be SCC, RTC receiving, of course, that balance of funds and then making sub-allocation decisions for the agencies in its region. Now I'll highlight that with regards to this money 
there was a structure for the investment. I noted some agencies facing dire fiscal situations. The state wanted to make sure that if you are an agency that is facing some very uh, strong headwinds, not able to provide your operational services, that you would be directing some of those monies toward operations before you really start to consider your capital program, your capital needs. And so what they did is they established, established under SB 125 an accountability framework. And that has the regions, the RTPAs, working in concert with the transit agencies to de develop a series of financial plans and reports that stipulate to the needs in their region, operations and capital, and that also will, will highlight the particular projects or services to be funded with the region share of money. State will be reviewing and then ultimately reviewing or intervening in certain cases to make sure that these investments are going to uh, ends that ultimately drive agencies and the regions toward greater financial sustainability, greater ridership growth, just recognizing that never mind if you're facing an operating, operating deficit, many agencies are still operating at below pre-pandemic levels. Many of them have pre-pandemic, or rather lower than pre-pandemic ridership levels. And within this base of this bill, there were also a variety of other measures that were taken uh, to extend statutory relief measures uh, that were instituted in 2020 and 2021 out through fiscal year 25-26. Those were pandemic-related statutory relief measures. While the pandemic from a public health perspective has largely subsided, the long coattails of what it has meant for, for example, work from home has, has meant that some of the underlying basis, the reality that ridership isn't where it once was, still obtain. Hence, the legislature extended that statutory relief through 25-26. But on that note, I will mention that that extension was not a blank check. And the state legislature said, if we are going to extend that statutory relief for additional years, many of the statutory relief measures, as I'll touch on in a moment, talk to the efficiency of the, the systems. They do want to see some longer-term reforms developed, ultimately implemented, that will happen under a new Transit Transformation Task Force, which will have under its charter review and ultimately reform the Transportation Development Act. So to be precise with regards to statutory relief, uh, there are uh, these two middle uh, provisions, suspension of the financial penalties for TDA, suspension of financial penalties for STA. That's just acknowledgement that under current law, if you are agencies who are not meeting fare box recovery thresholds that are defined uh, by where you are located in the state or the nature of your, your system, or if you are a system that is uh, with uh, growth that outpaces uh, simple inflation adjustments for your expenditures, you can be dinged. And you could find that your level of, of funding decreases or has new limits on what it can be expended for. And again, recognizing inflationary pressures, ridership declines, those were suspended further. And then there was this hold harmless provision which speaks to allocation of STA dollars, state of good repair and low carbon transit operations program dollars. I mentioned STA has as one component a review of the revenue base for the agencies. To be candid, there are some agencies for whom the revenue basis has not uh, found itself recovered. As a result, those agencies would see a massive real allocation away uh, from them in terms of funding that would compound their financial challenges and hence the state extended that relief. The final one just provides some flexibility to use monies that are otherwise identified for state good repair for operational purposes. That would be state of good repair. So state transit assistance, state of good repair dollars. They're uh, formula dollars but limited in use. And then finally, as I, I conclude on the state budget, the Transit Transformation Task Force, uh, it's one that will be convening in January of 2024. Uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be reviewing things like the Transportation Development Act reform, but it's also going to take a much broader and holistic review of public transit to see where the state can step in in terms of funding or policy regulatory mechanisms to support agencies in the recovery. So I'm going to uh, move through a, a bit of legislation just to highlight some of the things that have been on Metro's radar over the past year, uh, things that I've worked with uh, CEO Tree and his staff to identify, monitor, and then engage on. And I'm going to start with, of course, Metro's sponsored legislation, SB 862, 
uh, by Senator Laird. Uh, this is a bill that, is, as we've discussed in, in brief note, uh, authorizes Metro to move forward with that transaction and use tax that exceeds that 2% combined tax rate in Santa Cruz County. Uh, and that was necessary, as, as you, you well know, because we had two cities within uh, the county that were at the cap. And in order to institute a new tax, all jurisdictions within a county have to have the capacity to absorb that tax. Again, two didn't, and hence the need to increase that cap. So the legislation does afford Metro the ability to go after that, uh, uh, that um, ha half percent uh, sales tax, uh, and then that does provide some flexibility, uh, recognize the interest is to move in this next year, but there is the ability to go back in future years because there is some flexibility to move that legislation or rather that uh, local measure forward uh, through January 1, 2035. Of course, that was signed by Governor Newsom. Then there was a bill that we've been tracking because Metro has taken such a, an aggressive and, and progressive stance on, on housing, particularly uh, housing with natural nexus and uh, proximity to public transit systems. Uh, this is uh, SB 747 by Senator Caballero. And this bill would make some amendments to the Surplus Lands Act to resolve some of the issues that have long been uh, a challenge for transit agencies in terms of their disposal of property uh, and how it is that they can utilize that property for different ends. And so this bill does create a series of changes to that body of law. It creates a path for the transit agencies to develop parcels for com commercial use. Uh, I'll observe in the conversations that were had around operating deficits for the agencies, the restoration of uh, the state funds for capital one of the questions that often came up from legislators was, why aren't you doing more commercial development at your stations, your stops, uh, not acknowledging that they had put a prohibition uh, from agencies actually doing that type of commercial development near their stations that has been lifted. And then because there has been some, some questions around precisely the definition of disposal, the bill does create some clear definitions, provides greater guidance to the state's uh, Department of Housing and Community Development on how they should administer uh, that review and also does clarify what exactly constitutes an, a, an exempt parcel. Uh, just recognizing that you may be entering into lease agreements. If you are entering into a lease agreement that is under uh, 15 years, that would be exempt as, uh, as a disposal because you're using it for a short-term purpose. Uh, and this too was signed by Governor Newsom. Now I want to highlight one bill that unfortunately was, was held in the Appropriations Committee. Uh, and this is a bill that would have addressed something that's become more of a concern for agencies across the state and that of course has a natural, uh, very recent uh, issue or, or challenge uh, for, for the agency here. And this is a bill that would uh, address uh, agencies' access to electricity uh, during natural disasters, during rolling blackouts that could be instituted, for example, by PG&E under their PSPS program. And under current law, a hospital, a fire department, a police department has what they call an essential use customer status. That means that if there was an elective decision to turn off the power, those entities would see that they are last in the queue to have their power turned off. And PG&E will make some decisions to redirect resources to make sure that those essential services continue to operate because of their public safety, their uh, criticality to the public. Public transit doesn't currently have that same uh, designation. And of course, that is going to be a challenge as agencies transition to zero emission technologies per state mandate. We've acknowledged uh, at the state level um, through the advocacy that not only is there that challenge because of that transition to zero emission technologies, but it becomes more acute when you consider things like the role that agencies play in emergency response. Of course, Metro has played a pretty concerted role in emergency response in, in recent history. And then finally, as I conclude, I've got just a, a few more bills that I want to highlight. Uh, one is AB 610 related to fare free transit. You know that we had some conversation this morning about Metro's fare free program. Uh, this is a bill that would have created a new state program, Youth uh, Transit Pass Pilot Program, 
would have uh, driven agencies to form new partnerships with educational institutions, K through 12, community colleges, UC and CSU, uh, by way of uh, providing new funding to the agencies uh, if, again, they enter into agreements with educational institutions. Uh, and a lot of the structure here would be things that would naturally complement the work that uh, Metro does with Cabrillo College, with UC Santa Cruz, would be able to provide additional resources for one, facilitating the fare free programs, but in instances where they exist already, allow for the agencies to actually use some of those monies to stand up better services to those educational institutions. So not only is it free, but it's more frequent, it's more reliable, and that could, in theory, increase ridership further. This bill was made into a two-year bill, going back to my comment about fiscal cost pressures, intervention by Governor Newsom. His administration had clearly outlined this program, despite its merits, did not get funding in the state budget, didn't have a line item associated with it, and it would just only create a new cost pressure in a future year. He suggested to the author that they make it a two-year bill, meaning we can continue to have conversations in the second year of the two-year session, but don't send it to me because if you do, it would be vetoed. And then finally, we'll close on uh, measure ACA1, uh, which is notable because uh, this is something that has been on the legislature's agenda for many years. Uh, they've strong, had a strong interest in reducing the vote thresholds from the current two-thirds requirement to 55 percent. Uh, they were able to accomplish that this year, albeit with limited parameters. Uh, this uh, allowance, uh, provided it is approved by the voters in November 2024, would reduce the vote threshold, but only in instances where all of the monies from that measure are being used for capital projects. Uh, so things like affordable housing and public transit projects, not for operations. Uh, now there was, of course, some interest in seeing that brought into operations, but I will just reflect, it was a very fragile uh, balance of legislators who ultimately got to the point of saying yes on this measure, uh, and there wasn't really appetite from the author's office uh, in making modifications to the measure uh, in a way that could have jettisoned its success in the legislature for this year. And so that concludes my presentation for today. I'm happy to take any questions or comments from directors. Uh, back to the bill that was stuck in the appropriations and that qualifies the transit. So why was it stuck and what will get it out of there? Yeah, uh, I, I will say that this is one of the instances where because the process is pretty much a black box, we will never know precisely what it is that got that bill, bill held. All that said, the Transit Association, which sponsored that bill, is reconsidering introduction for next year. Um, it may be just a matter of the political relationships between legislators. Uh, it could have just been the year in which it was introduced. And so there may be another run at it. Uh, and then finally, we'll just note that there's also engagement on a regulatory and administrative level with the California Public Utilities Commission who sets these designations to see if they can find an administrative path to offering it. Um, was was this uh, prompted by natural disasters in various counties and their representatives are pushing it? I just. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So it was, it was introduced at the behest of Santa Barbara MTD uh, for many of the, the reasons that are evident uh, and was carried by Assemblymember Hart who's evinced a strong interest in addressing natural disasters, particularly in, in the areas of transportation services. In, um, I know that you can't tell us for sure, but in the Holden, which is the free fares for youth, um, what are its prospects in the second year? Um, in other words, and maybe a part, part of that question is, what about agencies that are already providing that? Would they simply no longer have to foot that themselves and have it sub, what in the bill now? Would the state just take over that free fare program expense? Or so the, the, the structure of the bill would have it so that if you have a uh, a program in place today, you, you would be mandated to maintain that program. 
In fact, would, it, the state wouldn't fund it. They just make us keep doing it. The, the state wouldn't, there would be a maintenance of effort requirement. <laughs> And the only thing that it would do here would be to allow you to expand into new educational institutions. So if there was another school district, for example, you can find new partnership there. But then to my earlier observation, for the existing programs that, that you have with, say, UC Santa Cruz and Cabrillo College, you could make other modifications that support but don't supplant the money that you're receiving. And so, again, operational expenses could be eligible. You can increase service levels, you expand coverage to uh, those campuses, but there was a strong interest in making sure that the state didn't assume the responsibility of what is often a local decision, and it can come through things like fee assessments on students. Uh, and, and part of that observation was that this was intended to be a short-term program. It was a five-year duration. There was advocacy from, in fact, the transit agencies saying that if we were to be in a situation where state takes on the support for a few years, what you might do is dissolve long-standing relationships for a short-term program, and then after that program expires, you may have no fare-free program and have to go back to the educational institutions and try to hit reset with them in restarting a program with perhaps you know, circumspect prospects. I don't want to give you an impossible task, but could you suggest why we would want to support such a program? I'm sorry? I don't want to put you in an impossible situation, but could you explain why you think we would want to support such a program? Yeah, I think that the, the interest there was in, in seeing if there could be some further support in the services that are being provided. It allows you to do some offset for those operational expenses. And so it was there, I think, that there was the interest in the support. Thanks. Director McPherson. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, in 2016, we passed a Measure D. Uh, half cent or sales tax uh, for uh, transit, and we became a self-help county in the eyes of the state, which uh, in conjunction with Senate Bill 1 allowed us uh, a, a better avenue to get more funding from the state. Does this, would, if we passed a, a sales tax uh, next year uh, for Metro, would that help us in getting state funding to become identified as a self-help county in that regard? Yeah, it would, because as I understand it, the local partnership program, which is, I think, the program you're referring to under SB1, right. does configure the uh, investments from the state and the share that, that individual regions get based on the measures that they have in place, the level of investment that they're providing. You would see a higher level of investment for your agency, for your region, and hence be able to capture a larger share. Of course, that means for everyone else, because we're talking about a sure. finite pot, everyone else gets a smaller sliver but you would get a larger one in that yeah. process. Be a good selling point for yes. our campaign, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Other questions? I have a question on this um, Holden bill. Um, what, so what, what incentives are there for educational institutions to support transit districts in accomplishing this? Or is it just to help us out? Uh, Has the state put anything in place? Has the state put in anything in place to support partnerships between? To incentivize educational institutions to make this happen. They have not. And this would be really the first time where there would be a new program that would be established that would create that form of new financial incentive, albeit only for establishing new programs. New programs, not existing ones. That's right. So there's, there's nothing in this bill that would, for example, um, compel or or support your existing partners, partners to say we want to re-up for another five or ten years. But if it were a matter of a wholly new partnership, there'd be that financial support that would be provided. So are communities that have been innovative and done this, are they being in some ways penalized? I mean, it's... <laughs> I, 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 th I think it depends on, I guess, the, the v viewpoint. If if it's a matter of only thinking on precisely, for example, backing out student assessments as support, then yes. But if you could also consider that other aspect of the bill, which would, would be you could provide higher levels of service to that community in a way that's more than just baseline, then there would be that ability to provide some form of additional support. Okay. And, and what that would look like, I mean, you mentioned other school districts. Yeah. But let's say we've already covered other school districts. So what, what, what else would it look like for us to have expanded 
services. So, so that would be for the existing colleges that you are servicing. If uh -huh. you have 30 minute headways, you could reduce those to 15 and you'd be able to use the base of support from this program to provide that higher level of service. Okay. And so it's not yeah. expanding into new spaces, but you could redouble on got it. where you've got the partnership. But what I'll just reflect to the observation or question about prospects, this is the fifth or sixth version of uh -huh. this bill. Mm -hmm. It has not, it has not been signed mm -hmm. over those five or six trials, including last year where it was vetoed. I think the prospects of this bill moving forward with any degree of, of buy-in uh, from the administration uh, is very low. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Song. Following up on that, I know my first thought in, in the north end of the county, our, our schools don't provide buses. I mean, there's uh, very strong financial issues in the school districts that are not getting the funding, equitable funding in uh, the statewide. <coughs> in these areas because of the rating. And um, so that was the first thought I, I'm thinking they are, they're struggling to cover this, fund the various programs they have. So I, I'm feeling the same is that, you know, it's been really wonderful throughout our county to have their youth ride free, but this bill seems, yeah, it does seem like it would penalize because it would be very hard to add to what we're already doing. So I, I was, concerned about the same thing that our chairs raised that yeah. I don't see a benefit and you know the strongest things that we're doing right now are already supporting Cabrillo and UCSC that do have contracts so I, I yeah it feels it feels like it's a penalty penalizing those that are being innovative so yeah and I'll just observe on on this front that the transit agencies writ large I'll put on another hat and just observe by service, the executive director of the California Transit Association. The association and its members have not endorsed this bill yeah. okay. because they've realized that there are Surprise. perhaps disparate benefits to uh -huh. agencies across the state. Uh, we've been, frankly, in a position of uh, engaging to make a bill and a concept better. Uh, we'll acknowledge that when this bill first was introduced, albeit last year, in a different form, the version of the bill that was introduced would have uh, taken away all state funds for agencies if they had not established a fare-free program. Oh, wow. And so this okay. is the middle ground. Uh -huh. okay. And one other point, the, um, <coughs> you know, I, I picked up on asking Metro to do more, or not Metro Transit to do more for commercial. And, and in the past, we have uh, developed commercial as uh, part of our metro stations and things. And then the push has been, the need has been housing. So that kind of feels like, you know, whiplash on that is we're doing wonderful things for housing and then it's like, what are you doing for commercial? Yeah. That makes no sense to me as well. Yeah, I think the interest there, and this is one of those areas where I would say that there's conflict in the legislative direction uh, with regards to housing commercial development is that within the conversation on operating deficits that the agencies are facing, of course, through the association, there was the advocacy to have the state intervene and provide the support. And the state was um, very willing to say, what have the agencies done to resolve their own issues? And so there was a strong focus on, have you instituted local option sales taxes? Many have. There was a strong interest in, have you found other forms of ancillary revenue to address your operating deficits? And it's there that the conversation turned to, are you doing value capture based on commercial developments around your stations? We were able to say, well, no, we have not done that because there are preclusions in state law that say, say affordable housing has precedent over all other forms of development in our parcels. Hence the uh, walking back of Surplus Lands Act, the uh, uh, flexibility to consider commercial developments. That's not to say that affordable housing is no longer priority but here, the Transit Association wanted to recognize that tension. You cannot tell agencies to develop and yet preclude the agencies from developing and then asking them why they haven't done that type of work. I just wanted to add comments that echo what I said to Chris earlier about his work at the federal level. We've had a banner year, and I know that you played a key role in making that happen. We have 
again, good local legislators, but it takes someone pulling that effort, lobbying effort together, and we, we really do a good job for this agency. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And I'll echo those comments. Thank you so much for your work, and thank you for being here today. I appreciate the time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We are on item 15, Mr. Tree. Sounds great. Um, you know, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, certainly um, what Washington did in regard to arches and providing that $1.2 billion for arches and uh, what that really means to Metro. Metro's a founding partner with arches, and the goal of arches is really to uh, produce uh, through infrastructure, bringing people together, green hydrogen, which was a key to us going down a hydrogen route. We'd be doing our part by operating hydrogen buses with no tailpipe, but the industry was needing to catch up with the production of green hydrogen. And so this affords that opportunity. The business plan with Arches was to deliver to its members $5 a kilogram for hydrogen. And uh, just to give you an idea, right now, if you were to secure a contract in the marketplace for hydrogen, it'd be about $9 a kilogram. So their goal cuts in half your fuel bill. And uh, so that's an important component moving forward with your zero emission plan. And uh, I, uh, you know, I've been asking the question when, right, and the details, and, and they're not quite out yet. They're not quite flushed out yet. Uh, Arches actually asked for 1.5 billion. They were given 1.2, and so there's an ongoing negotiation right now uh, with the CEO of Arches and the federal government as to how to uh, get their budget, what that looks like at the 1.2 billion level. But more information to come, and uh, that certainly was an extraordinary investment for California and for Metro. Um, you might have seen the three articulated buses uh, that are up in, uh, up in the Santa Cruz area working and getting students onto the UCSC campus. They've got the big red uh, San Diego Metro logo on them. It doesn't say San Diego Metro, but it's certainly flying their colors. And those are getting wrapped this weekend, and the wraps are amazing and stunning. Uh, I won't even say what they are. I'll just let you see them as they're, they're introduced next week if you get a chance to be out and about. Uh, three additional Arctic buses are delivered, will be delivered today. So you'll have a total of six in really good condition. Uh, they'll be wrapped soon, and then an additional three articulated buses should be coming in, in the next week or two. So that gives your articulated fleet nine from San Diego, and then there's two remaining buses that we had in our fleet of four articulated buses that are uh, in good condition and that we're still operating. So long story short, um, you know, we're, although we're capturing um, when we leave students behind on these busy routes, uh, they have been much less frequent than last semester based on the the, um, the buses that you're running based on the additional operators that you've been able to bring on board. And uh, I see uh, Anna Marie uh, here, as well as Daniel Zaragoza. They're leading our operations right now, and they're just doing a fantastic job of sensing when uh, there's going to be a problem with students being left behind and immediately deploying extra buses to the route to, to get them where they're going as, quick as quickly as we can. Um, I do want to uh, acknowledge that phase two is uh, the community gives us responses, their comments to it, it becomes baked and then delivered to you for consideration would require an additional 12 buses, 12 40 foot buses and Riverside Transit Agency, I think I've mentioned in the past, is willing to provide us up to 15 40 foot uh, buses for that purpose. And these are buses that, that are about at their midpoint in life. So they'll be uh, easy to maintain or easier to maintain than something that uh, certainly is ready to be retired. So that's moving along well. Uh, over the last week, you've taken delivery of seven Paracruz vans. So you'll recall Ford canceled our order after waiting for like a year and a half for the vehicles and the board authorized a, a subsequent reorder. And uh, so those have been delivered and that'll be great uh, for Paracruz and for your uh, disabled population that can access that fixed route system. Um, you heard from Eduardo and in, in the recruitment. I mean, uh, 
the agency is just doing amazing things in regard to the recruitment. And uh, Eduardo's been a fantastic uh, ambassador for the agency as he's been out and about and uh, looking for underemployed and those uh, with lots of talent to bring into the agency. Um, in regard to ridership wise, um, just want to give you a couple of statistics to give you a feel for where your ridership is going on your fixed route. Uh, overall, uh, year over year, it's up 15% this year over last year in the same time period. Uh, the students at UCSC, you have a 30% ridership increase uh, the first week of the semester over the previous semester. So that's a really positive trend. Uh, and uh, again, the students cruise free is consistently up over 400% in the ridership with, with that program. So overall things are getting busier on Metro and that's great. I, I get around and I see the operators and it's what they love to do is carry people. And so I think there's a good positive, you know, vibe with the operators and what they're, what they're doing. Uh, I just had one last uh, point to make, and then, uh, and then I'll conclude my comments. Uh, we recently received a phone call from AMBAG, and I know that uh, I think Kristen Brown, board member Brown, sits on AMBAG, as well as Director Koenig and also uh, Mayor Montesino, and they uh, recently uh, notified us that the AMBAG board at their next meeting would be uh, considering and, and hopefully approving its uh, staff recommendation, a $2 million award for your housing project in Watsonville. And I know Director Koenig in particular paid uh, a lot of uh, attention to what was going on there with that project and with that funding opportunity. So uh, lots of thanks to, to him in his efforts uh, towards that. And uh, so as, uh, as you get your AMBAG packet uh, next time around, uh, there should be that $2 million award, or uh, yeah, $2 million award for, for the Watsonville Housing Project to, uh, to consider there. So uh, excitement in that project, that brings that project to nearly $12 million in Metro money, and that'll be complemented with uh, MidPen and their uh, financing of the project. So that project could see a groundbreaking in the near future. And then the only uh, other project Project, although we're watching the Capitola project with the mall, hoping that at some point that gets revived with some housing components, you, you definitely have a seat at the table with your transit center there. But um, the other project, obviously, that we've been working on behind the scenes, and I'll bring to you information in the near future, is, uh, of course, your project in the county at uh, SoCal and Highway 1, about 60 housing units in conjunction with a Paracruz facility. So... Um, That'll conclude the, the comments, but would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. Questions or comments from directors? Lots going on. I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Yeah. When do you sleep, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for those updates. Thank you so much for all the amazing work that you and everyone at the Metro is doing. Um, it's, it's shows, so we really appreciate it. Awesome. Um, if there aren't other questions and comments, we will adjourn this meeting. Our next meeting is Friday, November 17th at 9 a.m. at the Capitola City Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue. Okay. Thank you.